Hi, I'm Guy Lawrence and you are listening to the Guy Lawrence podcast. If you're enjoying this content and you want to find out more and join me and come further down the rabbit hole, make sure you head back to guylawrence.com.au. Awesome guys, enjoy the show. Mario, welcome to the podcast. Ah, oh, it's great to be here. Good talking with you again. Yeah, nice to see you, mate. Now, uh, Mario, I ask everyone on the on the show, um, if a complete stranger stopped you on the street and asked you what you did for a living, what would you say? I uh, teach people how to make their culture very, very important and understand how that culture in a very, very subtle way structures your life, your relationships, your longevity and your health. Yeah, right. And, I'm, and I have no doubt that will spark off a couple of questions. Because the first thing I go, well, how does culture affect your health? You know, it's, it's something we don't even think about. That's right. We don't. And uh, the way to look at it is uh, you look at the world and the world has infinite potentials of being interpreted, many interpretations. And what your culture does, which is your collective beliefs on important things and making meaning of important things, that would be the culture. The culture will weave a, a fabric around the world, and that's what the brain interprets. So the brain is very cultural. And we know this now from cultural uh, neuroscience and cultural uh, psychoneurology. So basically what you're seeing is what you were taught to see as a collective group. And that collective group could say, middle age, you're supposed to be looking old and you're supposed to be getting sick. Or uh, in this family, everybody has diabetes, and those are premonitions or not premonition those are those are pre supposition suppositions that are made and then somehow you begin to uh, believe that and your body begins to accept that as a reality uh, so then uh, medicine unfortunately some medicine supports that they'll say well you're going to have diabetes in your family so you might as well get used to it because you're going to have diabetes and that's bad science those are only uh possibilities those are um things that could happen that could be triggered by the way that you live, by the way that you think, by the way that you eat. So these are only um, probabilities, not genetic sentencing. Got it. So, so would it be fair to say then that our beliefs are governing a lot of our own health, but yes. the, the culture is affecting the beliefs? Yes, the culture basically. Now, when you talk to reductionist scientists, they'll say, well, that, that's crazy. That makes no sense. And how can, a, how can a belief affect your immune system? And the way that I try to explain it, that even those, to those reduction of sciences, they understand it. And is this. We were, as animals, uh, for example, uh, most animals have a lot of uh, what's called uh, epigenetics. They can actually, something happens to them, and they pass it on to their next generation. For example, rats, you give uh, rats when they're grooming, they groom and they make a connection. Then you give them a poison. You give one rat a poison and then the, the, the rat gets sick, goes back to the other uh, rat. They, they groom again and those rats will never eat that poison again, nor their offering, offspring. So it's an, ep an epigenetic transfer. But then we lost a lot of that because guess what? We came up with language. So then the immune system had to adjust to language where it becomes biosymbolic. Not only does the immune system with the rats, they don't have to worry because they pass it on uh, epigenetically. But we, since we have a language, in order to keep us safe, to keep us healthy, the immune system also becomes biosymbolic. The immune system also responds to symbols. So it's, it's, a, uh, it's really a, an evolutionary process that once consciousness was created, and consciousness became something that what we call it now is when we started burying our dead. When our dead meant something enough that you just said, leave them over for the worms. So then we're predisposed to pay attention to what I call culture editors, because we're one of the few animals that requires tremendous caring for many years. A horse is born and, and, and immediately they, they start walking and they start feeding. Well, we need a tremendous amount of uh, development and help until our language and our other uh, facilities or our other capabilities uh, um, are uh, developed. So then we're, we're designed, not programmed because they're not machines, we're designed to pay much attention to the culture editors, which are the people that have life or death in their, in their hands. And you're born and you cry and you're hungry. You don't know you're hungry. You don't have a name for hunger, but, but your physiology is saying hungry. Then you see a breast or you see a bottle 
And all of a sudden, after a period of time, your hunger is satiated. So you have another psychophysiology, the hunger and the satiation of the hunger. You don't have words, but then later you find out that that's a breast, that that's a bottle, and that's a mother. Once you have the language, you already have a biosymbol of how it feels. So then that biosymbol becomes linguistic. Got and it. that's what it works that way. So then that mother says to you later, very important, or culture editors, which are people that the culture gives them uh, power in a particular context, a mother at home, teacher in school, clergy at, at church, and you, you're learning, you're picking up, and they have tremendous placebo effect to heal or nocebo effect to harm. So then your mother, who's a culture editor, and you have depended literally on her, she says, you're so stupid, you would never learn anything. Well, since it's biosymbolic, stupid has an effect. And guess what? When you're, when you're shamed, your immune system secretes inflammatory molecules, and you have inflammation all over your body. Wow. It's biosymbolic. You know, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, I, I had um, a gentleman, uh, Dr. Srini Pillay, on the podcast a few weeks ago. I'm not sure if you knew of his work, but he mentioned of a study where they actually took a laptop and they, they put it in a small village in Ethiopia for the kids that weren't actually touched. I'd never seen a laptop before, but weren't actually being culturally edited too much. And he said the first day they, they didn't know what it was and they were trying to fit, just tap it. And the next thing, a few days later, they figured out how to turn it on and then start to type. And he said within five months, they hacked into the U.S. Department of Defense or something. <laughs> From the fact that they actually had no limiting beliefs about anything and they just kept. Yes, that's right. Because the culture will, will set the horizons. The horizons, but we see them as, as, as a borders. So, for example, there's a, uh, when you study uh, first courses in psychology, they teach you about optical illusion. And one of them is the mutilier illusion, and you've probably seen it. It's two lines. One line is on top of the other, and one line has the arrows going inward and the other arrow going outward. Okay. And when you look at the line, even though they tell you and you can measure that they're both the same, the outward uh, arrow makes the line look longer. It's an optical illusion. So you go, well, that's how the brain works. That's just a, a universal. But if you go to the Kalahara Desert in South Africa, so where they don't have those limitations, they have horizontality, you ask them, which line is longer? They say, they're both the same. No optical illusion. So even that is culturally learned. We only have a few. We only have a couple hundred uh, reflexes. Everything is culturally learned. Everything else is culturally learned. Amazing. So it's powerful. And that's what I'm bringing to science. I'm bringing the cultural component, which is the missing link. Um, uh, we, we, don't look, we don't look at it. I mean, I never looked at it in my own life, with my own no, health. No, we don't. We're Being not taught. For decades. Sure. Yeah. Because we're not taught. Culture is, even in psychoneuroimmunology, which is the study of how thoughts and emotions affect the, the immune, nervous, and, and okay. uh, endocrine system, they don't look at culture. So what I'm doing, and my mentor was the one who created psychoneuroimmunology, George Solomon, they called it psychoimmunology at first and then psychoneuro. Well, what I'm proposing now is cultural psychoneuroimmunology, which is the missing link. You can't just study rats and you can't just, just study uh, cells and molecules and the immune system without the context. Because for example, in a collective society like Asia, uh, where you have Korea, Japan, China, the in a relationship with the group is more important than the individual. In Australia, the United States, UK, it's more individualistic. The individual is the one who thrives and the individual is the one who, who gets the attention. Well, if you shame somebody in Australia or in the United States, they take the shaming personal because you're shaming the person and they have inflammatory molecules. But if you shame someone in Asia, you're only shamed if they see that their family, their country, or their group has been shamed, not the individual. So even that, the immune system waits for the culture to interpret it before it responds. So, so you're saying then our direct emotions are affecting our immune system? Yes. Essentially. Yes, because the immune system becomes biosymbolic. So it's really part of the linguistic and, and biosymbols that we live. So, for example, in some countries in, in, uh, in Europe, Social services will give people, when they turn 55, uh, they give them a cane because they say, eventually you're going to need a cane. And people start walking with a cane 
and they start adjusting to the cane and they look old. Where in other countries, like in Sardinia, where you're going, where I, where I study Sardinia, it's one, as you know, one of the blue zones. Uh, they don't have that. They don't walk with canes. And you see people walking with canes and they take three or four steps and then they use the cane. Not necessary. But they learn that and then the biology will gradually adjust to the cane because that's the belief system that you bought. Wow, it's amazing, isn't it? So, I, I, you know, I'm curious, where did your fascination for all this work come into your, for yourself, Mario? Like, Even before I was a psychologist, here's where I learned about culture. I, I, I'm, I'm Spanish, Spanish, French. And I, I moved to, my family moved to New York to an Irish neighborhood where all of a sudden, if you're not blonde or redheaded or, or you're blue eyes, there's something wrong with you. So all of a sudden, I, I start, not all of a sudden, gradually, I started really feeling bad about myself. And I said to my mother, you know, I think I want to dye my hair. I was about eight or nine years old. I want to dye my hair blonde. And my mother was very wise. She said, go ahead. If you want to do it and look like a clown, go ahead and do it. <laughs> so, but then I thought, there's something here. I didn't know it was culture, but there's something here that makes you even better or worse. And cultures tend to put down the, uh, the most recent culture that comes in. Uh, and 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 you're 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 made to feel, or they invite you to feel worthless. Now the there was a time when the Irish were the victims. The Irish they had in taverns in New York. They 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 would the, the signs outside would say no dogs are Irish allowed. Then the Irish become the the subculture, and then they start um, criticizing and 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 prejudicing the the other cultures. So that's it's kind of a human uh, trait that we need to work on and we need to change. But you see, that was, the, that was my introduction to, to culture. Wow. Uh, not in a good way, but sometimes you learn good things that with bad things happening to you. It's interesting, isn't it? Well, why do you think we are frightened to stand out? Like, and why do you think we, we pull the people that are, want to stand out and shine and, and, and be, almost be their authentic selves? But we, we, can, we can kind of be held back constantly and want to fit in. Yes, that's a great question. I'll tell you why. Because our cultures teach us what I call pseudo uh, humbleness. It's not real humbleness. Uh, a little girl goes to her mom and she says, oh, mommy, look how pretty I look. And, and the mommy says, no, no, darling, you never say you're pretty. You wait for people to tell you and then you deny it. So what does that do for your self-esteem? You, you can never say, look how, look how good looking I am. Look how smart I am. When I do workshops in different countries, I'll ask people in the Philippines, for example, I was very collectivist, and I ask them, how many people here are bright and beautiful? And they look around for permission before they can raise their hand. You go to Germany, and you can't stop them to, stop, to, uh, to talk uh, about themselves. They just keep their hand goes up, and they go on and on and on. So it's cultural. But that's what we're taught. We're also taught, like, you, if I go to dinner by myself, for example, the uh, hostess will say, only one? And I, I always say, how, how many do you need? Oh, no problem. Are you looking for a problem? Oh, no, no. You know, so you see that? It's all built in. So, and they, right, they want to put you by the bar or they want to get you a bad, bad table because one is not as valued, even in, in, in uh, individualist cultures like in the United States. The individual uh, is not supposed to be expressing their greatness. And what I learned from centenarians is that they're totally different. They're outliers. There was a 102-year-old uh, centenarian woman and she was really very attractive she must have been incredibly beautiful she still was at 102 so i said you know you're a really a beautiful woman and she said yes i know i've always been beautiful ever since i was a little girl i was beautiful see how refreshing that is they, they they're outliers they don't buy into the pseudo humbleness so we're taught that and then we're taught do the best you can but don't outshine don't uh and in the United States, they have the opposite of Japan. They say the nail that sticks out gets hammered back in. In the United States, they say the squeaky, the squeaky wheel gets, uh, uh, gets oil. Uh, so you see, it's all cultural to a certain degree. Certainly. Uh, and we're taught that we're not as good as the group, even an individualist. And the individual should never express their value. Their, their, their personal value, their personal excellence is not to be expressed. You have to wait for other people to tell you. Because that, they call you conceited and they give you all kinds of names. So how do we, I'm just thinking, that, like if we've been living our whole life a certain way, and like you speak about the cultural editors and, and uh, this, we're, we're, it's almost like we've been molded to, to behave a certain way. Yes. And, 
and then there's like the truer part of us wants to shine through and, and express its full self, but it's frightened to because of the, the beliefs that we have from our culture. Then how do we start to move that? Because the one thing I find, I find a common theme is that we're almost like not worthy. We, we, don't, we don't feel right in ourselves. And the moment we try to, to break that mold, it feels really uncomfortable and we retreat back. Yes. Well, first, to know that the brain is very pliable. The brain is constantly readjusting itself. Thoughts and emotions and, and beliefs affect the brain. They actually change the structure of the brain. Taxi drivers in, in, in London who have to learn the streets, because it's not like New York, the first, second, third, they have the names. Uh, there's a part of the brain, the hippocampus, that stores information on, on relationship with things and, and locations. Well, the hippocampus of uh, taxi drivers in London ends up a lot, much bigger than the normal person or taxi drivers that know the directions based on, on numbers. So the brain is adjusting. And, they would, and, and some would argue, well, it's because they already had a large hippocampus. Not true. When they start, they all have the same hippocampus and it, and it grows based on what you need. That's the first thing. So it's pliable. The second is, so this is what I teach in the book, that you have to create subcultures of wellness, subcultures that support your excellence, su support your, uh, your abilities, that if you say, and you're 40 and you want to go back to school, they'll say, oh, don't, don't do it. I mean, you're going to be retiring pretty soon. They kill the joy. So cultures that say, oh, wonderful. What are you going to major in? And that's how centenarians are. I ask a centenarian, so what are, what are your plans? Because I try to be very anthropological. I don't cut a... You know, I, I leave it open so I don't give them any, any kind of cues. And I said, what are your plans? And one of them said, well, I'm going to start learning German at 102. So the present is never too late to make decisions, which is one of the four um, commitments that you make uh, for centenarian consciousness. Yeah. So then the, the, the answer is that we can change any time as long as we begin to see how we, we're in that fishbowl. And then we begin to look for people that support our new belief systems. And then gradually things begin to change. The, the brain is extremely pliable so at any age. Yeah, I love that. The neuroplasticity is shown so much now, you know. Um, yeah. So the company we keep is really important then. Very much. If you look at the eight people that you interact with the most, look at their health, look at their positivism or negativism, look at whether they're overweight or not, and those people are constantly bombarding you with their belief systems. Yeah. And I, I found in my own journey, Mario, that once I started to want to change my personal life, when I it's almost like as I was waking up and looking yeah. at people around me, it, you know, it was hard because because I'm, all of a sudden I'm in a group of people and I'm and then I was that person too. I was unconscious of this, but then I was starting to become conscious of it, and I was trying to change. But you know, it took time. It took it took time. Yeah. To, of course, and the uh, the idea with the, with the books that I've written is about teaching how to do that using anthropology and, and using cultural um, science, uh, neuroscience, because there's a way, if you have the tools, there's a way, but you have to be very careful to the kind of things that people talk about. I'll give you an example. When there, there's a study that just came out that looks at MRIs, functional MRIs, which actually show you what's going on at, in vivo at the moment in real time. And they looked at people that are constantly talking about negative things and people that are talking about positive things. The brain is different the way that it, that it shows the, uh, the activity, completely different. Because you're bombarding yourself. And since it's, it's biosymbolic now, uh, if you say, oh, look at this terrible thing or look at that terrible thing, you create neuromaps of negativity and the brain will try to support the neuromaps that you create. So then you look for selectively for negative things that are going on in the world. You can always see negative things. Now, it doesn't mean you want to be Pollyannish and everything is wonderful. You have to get upset. You have to be the solution, but you jump out. It just It's a cue for you to go into resilience, not to go into spinning the negativity. That's the difference. Yeah, almost like see it for what it is, not for what exactly. you think. Yeah, yeah. How many... How many um... I'll I bring up the centenarians because obviously I'm going there in a, in a couple of weeks with the Sardinian trip, which I'm really excited about. But how many um, centenarians did you go around the world interviewing? Uh, between what I did and between the uh, the other works that other people have done, over 300. Wow. And Sardinia, as you know, is one of the one of the blue zones. I was in Rithnia, which is a, a spa in Costa Rica, 
and that's another one of the blue songs. I was there uh, teaching uh, a course, teaching a, a workshop. Uh, there's some in, in, of course, Okinawa. There's some in the United States in the uh, uh, Loma Linda area uh, of the Seventh Day Adventist uh, in Greece. So there, there are five, but there are more. It's just that they haven't found them. In the United States, we have over eighty thousand centenaries. Wow. In Australia, you have several, several thousand, over five thousand in Australia. Uh, so uh, they're and they're the fastest growing segment of the population in the United States. And and you'd be, it'd be fair to define the centenarian because I, I remember you saying that. But they're still mentally well. They're healthy. They're they're they're, they're living a full life. It's not like they've, they've been dragged to the finish line. Yes, uh, the ones that I studied were healthy centenarians, because there are some centenarians in 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 nursing homes and uh, assisted living who are not doing well. But the ones that I wanted to find out how they function were the healthy centenarians, and some of them lived alone. Some of them lived with family. But there's some keys to how, which are the causes of health. What I discovered are the causes of health, which they have a way of doing things. Number one is healthy narcissism, which is accepting your greatness and not being afraid of expressing it. Not boasting, but if somebody says, hey, guy, you really are bright. I love what you did. Yes, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. I, I feel good about that. That's it. As opposed to, oh, no, anybody can do it. That's pseudo humbleness. It's not real. That's the first thing. Uh, they love themselves. They think that everybody loves them. And what your biology catches is what you believe. For example, if you think everybody loves you, there's a certain amount of psychoterminology. If you're a superstar and millions of people love you and you don't believe it, you become a drug addict or you kill yourself or you don't enjoy it because you don't believe it, even though the evidence is there. So that, that's the healthy centenarian is very important. Another one is setting limits, setting emotional limits. Very important. And giving people permission to not like it. I'll give you another example. Uh, a uh, centenarian that I was interviewing is 101. And I asked him, um, could I talk to you? I'd like to learn some things from you. And he said, yeah, sure. I said, but is Saturday okay? And he said, yeah, Saturday is okay. I said, what about 9 o'clock in the morning? He said, no, 9 o'clock, I have a tango lesson. It'll have to be at 2 o'clock. See, they don't give up their joy to please other people. It's not selfish. It's just they already have a commitment. I can give you two o'clock, but I'm not going to give up my joy for your needs unless it's an emergency. So you see, those are the causes of health that I found from them. And the most interesting and the most positive and exciting thing about it is that genetics is only 20% of the longevity. The rest is the biosymbolic process of how they live and how they interact with people and the cosmology that they create for themselves in their lives and, and beyond. And that's amazing. And that gives everyone hope then that the fact yes. is we just need to start looking at ourselves and how we're interacting. I, I, the one thing I wanted to mention as well is that, um, because I got your book, The Mind Body Code here, and the, the thing that shone out for me was the four commitments for the centenarian mindfulness. And the first yes. one was about growing older is the passing of time and you're not your age. You're what would you do with your time? Can you explain Yes. That yes. Um, the, 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 that's the first uh, commitment. That growing older is only requires a passing of time. That you can't change. You're older today than you were yesterday. That's a passing of time. But aging is what we do with that time based on our cultural beliefs. So whatever you have time, whatever you do with that time is based on your cultural beliefs. Uh, some people think, well, at, at 50, then I have to basically retire and forget the world. Other people will say, I'm never going to retire. Those are the cultural beliefs. So what your aging will have, I mean, there's going to be some wear and tear, but at minimal compared to what the system can do to you with what you do with age, which is what you do based on the cultural beliefs that you assimilated, like with the cane at 55 and, and Viagra at 40 and those kind of things. It's just those, those are just presuppositions that, that don't have any biological uh, value but it becomes biological as you start believing. Yeah, right. I, I hear the study, um, and I'm paraphrasing here because I'll probably butcher the, the study itself, but they, they literally took um, a generation of, of men, and I can't remember if they placed them in a monastery or in a house or, or whatever, but they set up every single aspect of that house as if it was three decades before when they yes. were were living even what they had on the, the tv i think like everything and and the 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 
the measurements and markers they were taking of their health dramatically reduced. Yes, that was my friend, Ellen Langer. She's a professor at Harvard. Ah, okay. Yeah, she did that study. And what she did is she divided people in their 80s. She did the study in the, in the 1980s at, at, at Harvard. And she had, it, it was uh, like little, uh, little cottages. And one group was supposed to go and bring a picture of themselves of 20 years earlier. Right. They were not to, to speak of anything other than, than the time, like 20 years earlier. They, as you said, they go into a time bubble. And they weren't allowed to speak of anything beyond a certain time so they could live the time bubble for five days. The other people were told, uh, just go there and, and you're going to have a good time and reminisce about the good old days. And they measured all the supposed uh, markers of aging. The ones who were living as if they were in those times were doing so well that on the fifth day, they thought, we got we to gotta, we gotta figure out how, how to measure this. They had all kinds of measures. But what they did is they took a picture of day one, day five, and they inversed them, they reversed them, and they had a group of independent raiders look at the pictures and ask, how, how, what's the age uh, difference in these people? And they said anywhere from five to eight years. When they came in, they were walking like old men, and uh, I can't work, I can't get my bags. Oh, no, you have to get your bags on your own. When they, when they were getting ready to leave, they were playing touch football. Every marker went up. Sleep went up, appetite, vision, uh, strength of grip. But here's the problem. And, and Ellen and I have talked about this quite a bit. She does, she, she's come up with a much better system. What happens is that when they went back, within a few months, they lost everything because the culture brought them back into grandpa. Mm -hmm. They would come in and say, I'll, I'll carry my own bag. No, no, grandpa, let me help you. Finally, they give up. I'll get the coffee. No, Grandpa, I'll get the coffee. No, you can't do this. They, they lost it. Now, Ellen Langer does something completely different. She's working with women uh, who will have uh, stage four breast cancer using contextual kinds of things like that. So she's a very courageous woman. <clears throat> but look, it's context. But the culture will bring you back, and that's aging. The other one is growing older. And the other people, by the way, the other group didn't get better. They actually get worse. They were reminiscing about the good old days but not really bringing it to the present. Oh, it's such an important lesson in there, isn't it? That's yeah, incredible. yeah. Yeah, she's done some great work. Yeah, amazing. So at the, um, let's talk about the other three commitments as well. The, the, the second one you got, the present moment is never too late. To make decisions. Uh, that's another one of their premises. They never consider the present as too late because one is aging. If you're 80, what do you mean you want to go back to school at 80 or you want to fall in love at 80? Mm -hmm. But if it's, if it's passing of time, it doesn't matter. So, and the one that I told you that wanted to learn uh, German, another one's 103. And I asked him, well, tell me about your garden. How do you like it? And he says, it's pretty good, but wait till you see it in four years. <laughs> so <laughs> it's never too late to make decisions, four years. So they project the world out. And it's almost like you're tricking your biology. You're going to be around. You're going to be around. You're going to be around. Um, let me give you another example. The, no, that's the placebo. The placebo effect. There was a major study that was done in the United States about, they looked at, at death certificates of thousands of people. And in the Chinese language, uh, the, um, the character for death is, uh, I think it's number four. I believe the character for death. Four or, uh, yeah, I believe four. So they looked at the death certificates of Chinese Americans, and there was a significant difference in the death around the day four of the month. They looked at Americans, not at all. They looked at, uh, for the United States, for Friday the 13th being bad, nothing happened. Why? Because Friday the 13th is not related to death, is related to bad luck. But the fourth is related to death. Huh. Look how those symbols affect even your, your, your living and dying. Yeah, amazing, amazing. I am um, the, the the third one which we covered. I, I'll read them all out. Uh, was illnesses are learned, so I, I'm I'm guessing that's from the way we shape and our beliefs and our culture is affecting the immune system. And yes, 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 yes. Remember about that how illnesses are learned. Uh, there's no question that we have genetic components that are expressed or have the potential to be expressed for cancer or for whatever. The food is important, the environment's important, all of that is important. But in addition to that, there's a component that 
modern science doesn't look into, which is the component of learning. How can you teach yourself an illness? Let me give you a couple of examples and you'll see. You want to learn gas, uh, gastroenteritis uh, type of uh, uh, problems like uh, gastritis and reflux. The way you do it is you eat fast, you don't give yourself enough time to eat, and you uh, are doing multitasking while you're eating. How are you teaching it? Because the system is set up so that when you're eating, you have parasympathetic system working, which is the parasympathetic slows everything down and speeds up the digestion. The sympathetic speeds everything up and slows down the digestion. But what happens if you're eating and then you get on the phone and somebody tells you that your stock is losing value and no, no, you got to sell right now. Sympathetic, parasympathetic, sympathetic, gastritis, reflux. You go to a conventional doctor and say, well, you know, that's how it is. We're just going to give you some anti-acids and we're going to give you this to, to, to uh, suppress the acidity da, 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 and, and not even looking at how this was learned. Uh, fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia is an autoimmune illness. It's, it's not necessarily autoimmune in that it, it doesn't fight itself, but it has inflammation and other things. Fibromyalgia, you learn it by, in addition to having propensities, by learning very early in life hyper alarm for some reason that you had to be hyper alarmed and you couldn't sleep very well. You have to have very light sleep. Either your grandfather would come in and touch you or do something wrong, or your parents were fighting and you thought they were going to kill you. Something happened. And it was functional, it was functional to not sleep deeply. So you could stay awake, awake. But later, it's not functional anymore because you know your grand, your grandfather's not more not there anymore. And I'll give you my theory on that. But then what happens is that you learn to sleep lightly. When you sleep lightly, you are creating a problem with your um, you're not getting enough uh, human uh, growth hormone. Uh, the uh, the adrenaline and the noradrenaline that you're secreting chronically uh, will trigger your nociceptors, your your primary uh, and secondary uh, pain receptors. Uh, you become depressed because of inflammation. So what happens? You don't sleep well. You have um, chronic pain. You have depression, and you have a loss of energy. All of that learned. But here's the interesting thing about it: while you're doing something wrong for survival, it doesn't hurt you because it bypasses, because it has a survival component. That little girl had a survival component, but then if it's not functional anymore, it loses the survival component and then you get sick. It doesn't work anymore. How do you teach your body uh, emphysema? By smoking, because if the body, what the body does is tries to compensate. You get, you got the cilia of the, uh, of the, uh, the little microscopic hair of the inner lining. And at first you're putting some nicotine and some hot uh, smoke in there. So the, in order to protect itself, it begins to create a mucus to protect itself, a mucus to protect itself. And it goes on and on and on. After a while, more mucus and more mucus and more, more mucus to protect you. The mucus becomes solid and you start having problems with your breathing. It's not, it's not processing the oxygen like it should. And then you begin to have uh, the, uh, um, the, the types of, types of uh, breathing deficits and, or cancer. You're teaching the system to get sick. And in your work, you know that because, you know, you do a lot of health work and, and so forth. And now, if you teach illness, how can you teach health? How can you teach the causes of health? We don't teach the causes of health. Uh, when, I, when I learned neuropsychology, I learned the pathology of the brain. I didn't learn the, the, the health of the brain. It was when the brain works, this is what happens. When, when it breaks, this is what happens. What about when it's doing well? What are the, uh, what are the total horizons of potential? Well, we don't know. Yeah, and now we're yeah. beginning to study the brain with the potential that it has. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't yeah, it? It's it's interesting, isn't it? Isn't it? Um, um, you know, with, within the medical system, they can point the bone at you if if you got some kind of diagnosis, but they won't highlight the the areas of the people that are doing well from from a, a diagnosis and say, look at the look at the, how these are have been living the life and doing it and and over, overcoming certain diseases. And that's what I try to do. I try to look at the outliers. You're right. You look at the normal curve. And if you have an illness that's within the norm, you're okay. They're going to give you medication and they're going to help you. Rather than healthcare, it's uh, pathology management is the way I call it. But anyway, they say, uh, for example, well, with your illness, you have six months to live. That's bad science. That's only statistical. What you want to say ethically is 
on the average, people live six months or six weeks or whatever with your illness. But let's look at the outliers on the right side of the curve. These people live 10 years. How are they doing it? Let's see if we can learn something from them. That's the ethical scientific way to do it. But you know what happens when you do studies? The people at the end of the tails, they're called nuisance variables and they're not included in the studies. And the, <laughs> I feel like you're going to have for a cure. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Um, uh, let's touch on the, the fourth commitment, uh, which was forgiveness is a liberating act of self-love. Yes, that's another one of the causes of health. And as you know, I devote a whole chapter to that because it's so complicated. It's not an intellectual process. You can't forgive intellectually and say, I forgive you because I'm a Christian or a Buddhist or a Hindu. It doesn't work that way. The key is that some, someone did something to you and you made an interpretation of what they did to you. Then at the mind-body level, you work on the interpretation, not on the uh, person who hurt you. The person who hurt you is irrelevant is the image that you created in your stage of the world of that person. So you have to work it through with the techniques that I teach uh, of letting go by, use, by ex, as you said, an act of self-love to liberate yourself. But it's not intellectual. It has to be done on the contemporary stage and on some techniques. But the idea is that it, it doesn't have anything to do with forgiveness. It has to do with releasing. And that's what we call forgiveness. And you can have forgiveness with reconciliation or without reconciliation. You could have forgiveness for a mother and you want to reconcile and there's a process, but you don't, you don't want to have reconciliation with someone who raped you. There's no reconciliation there. So there's two and you have to understand which way and the techniques for each of them as, as you know, in the book. Uh, so they do it naturally. And I'll give you some examples. One uh, was in a, a concentration camp, a survivor of a concentration camp uh, in the Soviet Union. He was from Estonia and he had been in a concentration camp. So, I asked him, um, so what do you remember about the concentration camp? See, very ethno ethnographically, what do you remember? I don't bias it. Oh, well, it, things were hard over there, but let me tell you what I remember. There was a, uh, one of the soldiers who was just as young as I was. He, he, we became friends, and he would sneak up some bread for me, and we, came, we became really good friends. I, that's what I remember the most. And the other thing that I remember, and he started laughing, and I said, what, what is it? He said, well... When I got back, my mom said, why didn't you write me? And, and he said, mom, they don't let you write in concentration camps. <laughs> and he started laughing. So you see, but, but it's not Pollyanna. And I said, so what do you think of those people? He said, they were SOBs and they were terrible, but I'm not going to put my time into, into those people because I have better things to do. You see, that is the forgiveness process that I have to teach. And they do it automatically and, and uh, intuitively. But like you said, it's not from an intellectual, it's, it's no. deeper than that. No, because I've worked with people and they say, uh, for example, a father who sexually abused a daughter. No, no, I already, I've already forgiven him. They have a, better, a really bad uh, fibromyalgia, for example. Most of the fibromyalgia that I've seen has some kind of shaming wound early in life, uh, inflammatory, pro-inflammatory. And now the latest research in, in uh, depression is not so much serotonin, but it's inflammation. It causes depression. So um, then you uh, you learn that uh, that you have you have bought into a system, you have bought into a way of believing that keeps the chronic uh, inflammation going on. And then, let's say you have a predisposition for cancer. Well, cancer comes out. Predisposition for diabetes. Diabetes comes out because if there's one component that that is involved in most illnesses is really inflammation. Yeah, yeah, it's cause it's got a lot to answer for. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's great, man. I'll, I'll mention your book, The Mind Body Code, because I know you go deeply into the processes as well through that. Yes, I definitely recommend checking it out. Um, all right, Mario, I'm going to change gears. I'm going to ask you questions that I ask everyone on the show, and um, okay. the first one is: What's one of your low points in the in in life you've had, but later in life it turned out to be a blessing? Unrequited love. People that you thought you couldn't live without, and now you're thankful that they had the good sense of saying no to you. That's what I, uh, at my lowest points in my life. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I won't, um, I won't dig. Um, what does your morning routine look like? In the morning? Mm -hmm. uh, in the morning, I, I do a meditation to clean out whatever 
I picked up in my dream so I don't dump it into the day. So I do a meditation on that. And before I go to sleep, I do a meditation to not dump the day into the dreams. So you clean up that. And then, then I do some Qigong and, and I, I don't eat breakfast. I go to, I work out because uh, phylogenetically we had to go hunt and we had to move before we could eat. So I go out and I, and I move and then I come and I eat. Uh, and then, you know, I work out. I, I do uh, something that's really very helpful. It's what I call power walks. I go to this, where I live, there's a forest and there's a, a trail. And I do anywhere from five to eight miles uh, every other day. And it's wonderful to commune with, with, uh, with nature and I see deer and all kinds of things. So it's really, really good. But the other thing too that I do is that Mondays are supposed to be bad because you're starting the day. And in fact, the United States, there's some statistics that, that uh, show that most heart attacks happen on Mondays at nine o'clock in the morning. Yeah. But that's if, if you hate what you're doing. So what do I do with my Mondays? I do beautiful things. And on Mondays, I take myself out to dinner by myself to celebrate the, the Monday. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I, I always tell myself Monday is my favorite day of the week now. Perfect. Because there was a time in my life when I hated Mondays, like hated yeah. them. And, and now, because I'm, I feel like I'm on purpose, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm aligned. It's just like, wow, this is just magic. And I remind myself all the time. And it's, it's, it's great. You can't wait to start the week, but before you couldn't wait to finish the week. Correct. I was wishing so that, my weeks away, Mario. Yeah, but you see how cultural it is. It's the cultural construction that we give to time and space. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you could have dinner with anyone tonight from anywhere in the world at any time frame, who would it be and why? Um, Kierkegaard. Uh, the, the philosopher Kierkegaard. Okay. Uh, he, he was one of the existentialists that wasn't depressed all the time, like uh, Sartre and, and Camus, because he said the, the existentialists would say, well, this is all there is. This is where we are. Let me have another espresso and get depressed with you and have another cigarette. Kierkegaard said, the problem is that we're trying to deal with a fear and anxiety with the physical body, and that's fine. But when we go into transcendental, and we try to use the physical body to deal with that, it becomes despair. And the only way to come out of despair is to make the, the leap of faith, to jump into something, the, the leap of faith. And centenarians also, they're not necessarily religious, but they're, they're spiritual. And they make that leap of faith so they stop fearing death. So I would love to have a conversation with, uh, with Kierkegaard, although I don't speak Danish, but you know, I'm sure we could get along. We could get on, work it out, yeah, for sure. Beautiful. And uh, last thing, Mario, is there anything you'd like to leave the listeners today to ponder on from everything that we've covered? Uh, yes, I think that the power we have to make change, but to make the change, finding out where you learned it from your culture. Who were your culture editors? Who were the people that taught you that? And who are the co-authors that continue to maintain that belief system? That if you were taught that you're not, that you're not good in math, you have co-authors remind you you're not good in math. And when you do something well in math, then, oh, that's just a coincidence, and you buy into that. So uh, what I'd like to say is that we have tremendous ability to change, not only because the brain is very pliable, but because we have tremendous resilience. We've been about 150,000 years as homo sapiens, modern homo sapiens, refining the system. So now we have a very, very sophisticated system, not a machine, but a very sophisticated process of changing things in a way that, that 20 years ago was considered impossible. Yeah, beautiful. And um, I definitely encourage everyone as well to go and check out a blue zone or go and live like that for a week or two. Because I, I was in Costa Rica, Mario, uh, on the peninsula. Uh, last, oh, yeah. Yeah, last That's Christmas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, oh, it was magical. And to see the way these these people were and just genuinely kind and happy people. It was, yeah. you know, it was amazing. They're not troubled. And they think that everybody loves them. Yes, that's... <laughs> Which is not a bad thing. <laughs> so I'll tell you something before we go, so that I think it's really important on the healthy narcissism. I went to Cuba. They have a lot of centenarians there, not because of the revolution, that's before the revolution. And um, they gave uh, this 101 year old man a party after I interviewed him. And, and there were some women there, and he comes up to me and he says, Have you noticed how the women are looking at me? They love me. So that's narcissism. But healthy narcissism, which is inclusive, he said, And did you notice how beautiful they are? He brings them into his narcissism, you see? So it's inclusive narcissism, which is good for you. Yeah, I love <laughs> it. 
I love it. <laughs> well, it was great talking with you again. Congratulations. Thank you. And where can I send everyone to, if they want to check out more of your work? Where's the best? Uh, they can go to the website biocognitive.com or Dr. Mario Martinez uh, Facebook. Uh, they can just Google biocognitive science or Mario Martinez biocognitive science and they can, all kinds of things available there. And YouTube, there are a lot of uh, free uh, um, audios and videos that you can see. So there's a lot of information that you can get in addition to the books. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much for your time, Mario. I really appreciate oh, you're it. You're welcome. It Enjoyed it. All the best. Thank you.